This is We The Sales Engineers Podcast, show 106. Welcome to We The SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. What's going on, Benny? How you doing? Doing well, thanks. How are you? Good. It's week, I don't know, 17 of uh, lockdown, <laughs> the, tw- the miserable 2020. Although I do enjoy spending time with the family and you enjoy not having to comb your hair. Yeah, it's great. I got a mane or an afro or something. Yeah. Oh, I have no comments. How you doing? doing good afternoon. Good. Yeah, no, I'm really excited for the show. Uh, we have somebody that's been an SC and SE manager um, from California too. Goodness, sometimes I wish I was somewhere else, and that is a good place to be. Uh, yeah, like it's a good show. I, to- I can I can see the effects of COVID on you. Like <laughs> you're not sick in any way, shape, or form, but your hair is growing. I don't know. When's the last time you left your house? Uh, I did go grocery shopping a couple of days ago, like last Thursday. That was, what day is it today? Oh, that was yesterday, oh, my Wednesday, friend. Oh, Wednesday, Yeah, yes. something like that. I don't remember. <laughs> Today's Friday. It was, yes. So Thursday was yesterday. No, Just, no, no, no. I, 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 went, I went Wednesday. I went Wednesday. All right. So our guest today is uh, Diana, and I'm not going to say her last name because I'm going to butcher it, but... Capello. Capello? Capello. Yeah, I don't know the first one. Uh, it's Diana Lustander Capella. Well, that's the one I was afraid of butchering. Oh. <laughs> so, I might yeah. have on your behalf. <laughs> yeah, so Diana Capello. Let's just keep it light, keep it uh, sweet and simple. She she was great. She's on the forums. I met her on the forums. Um, she is an SE manager who still has SE duties and SE coaching duties, I guess as part of a startup called Clary. And I just enjoyed talking to her because she's the topic of the show is being candid. She's candid about everything that she does. And I just enjoyed talking to her. So let's talk to her. See you on the show. Yeah. So customer specific stories. Um, so a little background. When I joined Clary, um, we were changing direction to try to do less proof of concepts because they were time intensive and um, we were so few. There were only three of us at the time, SEs. And we were doing a proof of concept for every deal that we did. It was just, had always been that way. We were a startup for a long time and that was the way to prove ourselves. But as we matured, you know, we're going on, I think eight years now, we're not a startup anymore. I mean, we're more startup than say our competition, but we don't, have to prove ourselves that way. So what else could we do? Because the main reason people were asking for proof of concept is they just weren't sure it would work. So if I could tell them that it worked for another customer who's like them or had the same problem as them, then maybe I could avoid a proof of concept. Um, So, but now with everything that's going on in the world, um, we are more willing to work with our customers in that way to do proof of concepts. We are about 12 on the team now, so we have more time. And specifically in response to COVID-19, we are offering um, a quasi proof of concept. We're connecting to our customer's environment if they'll let us. And we are running analytics on their data to give them insight into how their pipeline might be affected by what's going on and what deals might be at risk and which deals they could possibly save or what they could find about their sellers patterns that could be corrected to help them sell more. Um, So we're calling it a a revenue assessment is what we're doing now. Okay. And how long have you been there for just out of curiosity? Two years this week. Oh, wow. Sounds like you've been there forever though, just from like the, uh, (laughs) like it. Yeah. In a good way. Yeah, we, we, we've been talking for like a few minutes and we're, I don't want to repeat everything that you just said on the, on the podcast. So I'm just going to use that information. Mm-hmm. And right now we're in the flow of the podcast, but for those listening, can you maybe introduce yourself to everybody? Sure. Um, so I'm Diana Capello and I am now a sales engineering manager at Clary, um, recently promoted. So we're really excited Congrats. about that. Thank you. Day 60 this week. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. and, uh, my background before I was in sales engineering, I used to be a Salesforce administrator and a marketing specialist, but, um, 
I was a film major and digital media major with a minor in theater. So I was always a storyteller and I just finally got pushed into being an SE by a friend of mine and said, hey, you really make a great SE, come work for me. And somebody else who worked there said, if it doesn't work, I'll put you in the marketing team. So, so this seems like a very natural path for a sales engineer to take to go to filming school and then become a, an SE. But not so you were you joined your company two years ago mm-hmm. and you just got promoted to an SE manager, mm-hmm. not during COVID, but right before COVID. Right before. Yep. So yeah. our fiscal year started in February. So okay. February 1st. So how did it go? Like right now you first, you were in the honeymoon phase of sales engineering management and now you have COVID. How are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, day 60 was last week or this week and um, my 90 day plan is out the window. Um, I followed a book called The First 90 Days, and I made a nice 90-day plan and reviewed it with all my leadership, and I was chipping away at it, and now I cannot recall what was in there. Um, So I need to revisit that. And um, I've been a manager before, luckily. Um, I went back to being an individual because I really wanted to work at Clary and work my way back into management. So it's not my first time around. But from everything that I learned the first time around of how I don't want to be a manager, that has really helped me in this time. Because as a new manager the first time around, I found I was very executional. Follow the pattern, follow the structure, stay in the lines, be productive, clone yourself. This time around, I wanted to be more personable. I wanted to be um, a guiding star, uh, an inspiration kind of a leader, not a micromanager. And so in this time in particular, people really need to trust their leadership and share and be vulnerable and lean on each other for guidance and support. And so luckily I've gotten all the bad habits out of my system, hopefully. And um, this time around, I'm getting much more positive reviews in the EQ space. And I think that's helping me in this time. That's very interesting. So how did you notice the bad habits while you were doing them? Like people don't generally notice their bad habits. I was very lucky. I had a great staff and they were willing to share with me and speak their mind. So um, I got, I asked for feedback in one-on-ones and they told me, you know, I wish we had a relationship like um, those two other SEs and managers over there where I could talk to you about my girlfriend. It's like, I don't want to know about your girlfriend. You're at work. Um, but later after I left and, and I was at Clary, I got some feedback from my AEs saying that I come off as a bit bossy or right. that I insert my opinion when maybe it wasn't appropriate. Um, and I ended up running into an ex coworker at an event and he said, wow, it's really great to see you smile. When we first met, you were such a bee. I was scared of you. And so all of that like happening in the same week for me and somebody else recommended reading Radical Candor. So I started reading it and it's all about that. It was just like nature was telling me, you know what, change course. And so I did. Right. Well, <laughs> Hopefully this, I'm going in the right direction. This might seem like a stupid question, but how many people are born in a way, and it takes a bit of time to change directions. You're saying you just did it. Well, when did they give you that feedback and when did you start changing actually? Yeah, that's a great question. It, I got the feedback as a first time manager three years ago okay. and I discarded it. I discredited it and I said, that's not me. And I didn't change. Um, so I actually called up my employees after I read Radical Candor and I apologized to them and I said, if I was your manager all over again, I would do things completely differently. And the one who told me that he wanted a better relationship was like, no, Diana, we got there eventually. Like you were good. It was fine. You know, the first year was a little rough. So I think building relationships and building trust takes time, but I was not consciously working on that the first time around where this time I am. And so when you pay attention to something, you can, see if you're going in the right direction and you can make adjustments and change course. When you're not paying attention, you're not working towards a goal, you're just going to float. 
So who knows where you're going to go. That's pretty interesting. Just out of curiosity, and, I, and maybe I think I may already know the answer and that a lot of people always say you have to kind of go down the journey to like really warrant where you ended up, I suppose, after the end. But kind of what you just said there about knowing what you could have done differently, um, but then also ultimately like you got, to, well, at least with that one uh, person, you kind of got to where you wanted to go. If you were to do it again, and you kind of said that maybe, you know, you, you would change how you would do it the first year, but would you kind of looking back, do you regret maybe having gone through that experience or if you had a time machine, would you do it a different way? No. <laughs> and I know everybody says that, right? Because no, you yeah. have to follow your path. I just wish I would have gotten there sooner. Sure. Um, I, if I had listened and internalized the feedback, and you can't internalize every single criticism about yourself, you'll go crazy. Um, but if I had, I could have gotten to where I wanted to be sooner. Fair enough. No, that makes sense. That's, uh, I think that's a good way to go. Um, yeah, no, that doesn't make sense. I do actually want to ask another quick question to go back to uh, something you mentioned earlier, this idea about you being a storyteller and just quickly jumped on the old LinkedIn and saw that's kind of what, you, what your header is or like what you kind of come into the world in, uh, world as rather is as a storyteller first and everything kind of follows after. Uh, how would you say that relates to sales engineering or just your career in general and the path you've taken being a storyteller? Oh my gosh. It, everyone asks like, do you use your film major? And I say every day because the best way to convey a thought or convince or influence someone is to make them feel something. And the best way to do that is through story. And I've known this to be true and I've been researching it in written form for the last year or two. Um, and I actually just was asked to read this book by our leadership. Um, let's see if it'll <laughs> It's I think it's something in persuasion. Harvard <laughs> Business Review, Emotional Intelligence, Influence, and Persuasion essays. Yeah. And there's an essay in here specifically about storytelling by a playwright and somebody who's worked on some Disney films. And it says, storytelling that moves people. And as an essay, we need to motivate motion. An object in rest stays at rest. Object motion continues in motion. And our job is to give it that push so that they get past the fear of doing something because your biggest competition is always do nothing, at least in my space. So I have to convince them that the effort they're gonna exert is worth it and that they're gonna get something better at the end. And the best way to do that is to show them the vision for the future, not storytelling. That's, uh, so, sorry, Reggie, so, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm on, I'm on the interwebs right now. Uh, I can't remember the name of the, the, the movie. I think it's John Grisham's A Time to Kill, Samuel L. Jackson and uh, Matthew McConaughey. The whole, the whole movie industry is storytelling. But when I understood the power of storytelling is when uh, Matthew McConaughey's character is doing the final address to the jury. And he tells them the story about like, imagine this would happen. You know, it's just go watch it because I'm going to butcher it. If you, it's probably on YouTube somewhere. I probably have already seen it in my action cinema film days, but I'm yeah. Right now. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, like that's where I understood where f like storytelling actually has an impact because I almost cried, and you know, I'm I'm not really a crier, or at least I'd like to say that <laughs> I have a reputation to uphold. Uh, but yeah, like story storytelling can. I love that you want to elicit movement from the from the customer. Yeah. Have and one of my about? favorite favorite tactics to do that is what you just quoted, which is imagine. Yeah. Imagine this. Imagine you are a busy manager, just got back from the UK on the last flight home, and you were so worried about your personal life, and now you have to get back to work, and you have to catch up with what your team has been doing the last two weeks. How are you going to do that? Let me show you. And then I show the demo. For, it gives or, them anxiety, and it gives them relief. Yeah, or imagine... Like if you don't do something, something bad's going to happen. Imagine it happens to someone you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's very interesting. So I'm just looking up my notes again. I guess so quickly in the meantime, just with respect to what you just said there, would you say that's kind of the main, like one of those, like the most important maybe secret out of the box thing that you found to be most effective with respect to storytelling uh, and demos and, and kind of presenting that value for a company? Yeah, I liken um, demoing or personalizing a demo to 
when you're selling a house and you get it staged. You get furniture put in there so they can imagine their own furniture being there. Show them where the TV is going to go. Show them where the sofa is going to go. And a house that's staged will sell a lot faster than one that's not. And so if we can tell a story that puts them in the seat and they can imagine themselves using your software, they're much more likely to buy at the end of the day. Because they're not going to remember what you said. They're going to remember how they felt. Totally. No, I love that. That's perfect. Just uh, make sure it's staged for the right people. Because I've seen customized demos for customer A being used with customer B. And the deal is lost because one is in uh, manufacturing, the other one is in health. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I've seen that. Um, you, you mentioned, like, you are, when you first started with Clary, you didn't have too many stories to tell customers with regards to your product. How did you overcome that? Uh, well, when you win some, then you got your personal story. Um, but I, what I did was I was rewriting the demo script that all of the sales engineers would get trained on and all the AEs would use too, because our AEs give the first and second demos usually. Interesting. So we need a standard script, you know, for people that don't know what to say. And I added a column to that script. So we had clicks, screenshots, talk track, and I added a column for other. And in there, I made an effort to put a customer story for each of the commercial or mid-market segments and also for any um, pain or solution that we were addressing there. So I showed up to the customer success team meeting and I bribed them with candy and asked them to share customer stories. So I'd say, okay, so who has a customer that really loves team activity? Who is it? What do they love about it? Do you have a quote you can share? And so I picked their brains for an hour and I put that into the demo script. So by being the one to discover them and to write them down and work them into the demo script, that helped me internalize them, even though they weren't my stories. The thing now is I tell the same five stories every time. So they're getting stale to me and I hope they're not coming across as stale to my customers. So I need to get, I need to continue to replenish the stock. I imagine though, every time a customer hears it, it's going to be the first time if you're talking to different people though, right? So that's what I tell myself, but my, my AEs are like, okay, tell that McAfee story every time. Right. I know it's interesting. Pick a new one. <laughs> so got to keep it fresh for everybody on the phone because the audience will pick up on that. If you're just showing up and going through the motions. Sure. My AE asked the same question to every meeting I went to, even if it's the same customer, which mm-hmm. is what is the coldest capital in the world? And it is not, no, Ottawa is the second coldest capital. It's uh, the, somewhere in the Himalayas, which makes sense. Uh, it's the Mongolian uh, capital. I can't remember the name of it. And it, it elicited some conversation. I hated every minute of it. Every time he asked that question, I'm like, <laughs> again? But like, it got the job done. It, it broke the ice. It got some conversation going. And I would imagine the same thing with your story. It's just maybe, I don't know, the way you would say it would change versus the content. Like, I don't know, pull a Tarantino, start with the end and and go back to the beginning or something like that. Well, that I love makes backwards sense. stories. Yes. Yeah. I love out of order stories. So start you've seen with the car chase. You've, you've seen Memento? No, I haven't. I have been binge watching Netflix for the last few years. I don't watch many movies but i did watch my first film in like probably several months today i watched frozen 2 <laughs> really good story <laughs> yeah, it didn't start with the end though no um, it doesn't but that's what you get when you have a three-year-old yeah um, but um yeah with with the stories they do elicit conversation but one thing is i'm very specific with what story i'm going to share during my prep before any customer call i prep with an ae And I always ask, what customer stories do you want me to share? Because I want to share the one that they're going to send as the case study after the fact. Or I'll say, hey, you know, I will have been talking for 20 minutes at this point. Maybe you should tell the McAfee story. Or, and then I'll pick up on how somebody else tells that story or they'll insert one that I don't know. And after I hear it a few times, it becomes one of mine. That makes sense. There's even a couple of things there that, uh, 
I feel like they just having well not only specific stories but just a wide variety of them kind of has two, two two benefits that I could see just right off the bat. One being the social proof of being able to kind of rip a whole bunch of stories out to just show that yeah, like, look how this is being used in this use case or another that might be applicable to you, uh, which then eventually might pressure them and be like, oh wow, everybody's doing this, I should as well. But then besides that, um, just like every customer issue is sometimes a little bit unique, having a story that aligns with that particular situation and. Uh, having maybe a specific story that relates to their specific situation will be that much more effective than just a general story that kind of touches on it. So having a nice repertoire of stories that have to do with different customer situations and also not to keep things from going too stale uh, definitely helps in quite a few ways. Yeah. Well, if it's a good story, it can't get stale. Like I've watched the movie Face Off maybe around a thousand times. So, uh, but I do have a question about the process. You mentioned that your AEs do the first two demos. Mm -hmm. So yeah, how, yeah. how many demos are in the process? Usually it's... Uh, yeah. Well, so I'm supporting enterprise and global strategic right now. So these are much longer sales cycles. And you're oftentimes doing the first demo to somebody who's maybe um, entry level at, in a sales operations role. And they've been assigned to go research who has okay. a solution, right? So we do forecasting and AI and activity capture for sales teams and marketing teams. We call it the revenue team. Anyone that brings in revenue can use Clary. And um, so we get lumped in with a lot of different um, projects. Like people are looking for BI, they look at Clary. They look for AI, they look at Clary. So usually it's an entry level person that comes to us first. So the okay. AE will do a broad harbor tour demo, try and squeeze in as much as they can and go, what sounds good? Who at your company would want to see more? And then they'll like follow that chain until they get somebody with real authority or ha who ha actually has a budget. And then they bring in the SE. So they're kind of like doing research on the account for a while. So in that sense, we don't want to have the SE show up and give the same demo every time, eight times a day. You know, if I'm supporting eight reps, everybody's cold calling. Um, so we are strategically brought in when it's time to, um, evaluate solution fit. So are they a good fit for us? Do they have the right tech stack? Are we going to work and are we going to solve their problem or to show a really important demo? Like, Hey, now we've got the CRO on the line or the VP of sales ops, and they're going to ask next level questions that they just frankly doesn't need to know. And then um, we're also involved for security. So sometimes the first time we talk to them is when we're talking to their security team. Okay. And how many, uh, how many uh, salespeople do you support globally? Yeah. So my team globally now, I think we're about 20 or 15, somewhere in there between the two okay. teams. But then commercial is much larger. Um, but we're mapped about one to four right now for SEs to AEs. So it's it's a decent mapping. Okay. Um, but yeah. given the proof of concepts take so much of our focus, um, we can't have too many AEs. We just wouldn't get work done. <laughs> what type of um, I guess structure do you have with respect to the AE and SE relationship? Is it kind of a pool where you have the SEs uh, kind of work with or rotate amongst different AEs or that one to four mapping is it that this SC is tied to this group of AEs? Um, it's designed to be directly tied to the AE. So I would know I'm always working with these four AEs, which has a benefit of you get to know each other, you get to work well together, your style. Downside is if you don't work well together or you both have the same weaknesses, it can be really bad or you're both new. So one of the teams I support, the enterprise team, their leader wants to have a pooled resource model. And then the strategic team, they're like totally happy with mapping. So we're playing around with that right now. And a lot of my team is still ramping. So it's really, even on paper, it's one to four. It's more like one to eight, and that's me. And then I've got my two ramping SCs that are helping me out. So, so how, how are you doing that? How, how are you being an SE, being a manager, and ramping up new SEs. I can't imagine. Do you do you have time off? I do pull a lot of 10 hour days. I try to limit it not more than 10. Um, but I told myself I would do that during the first um, 60 days. And then after that, I would get back to an eight hour day. 
Okay. Um, but yeah, my boss and I just had that conversation yesterday. He looked at my calendar. He said, what can I take off your plate so that you can do more deal work? Because we really, you're the one who has that knowledge. You have to be the one to do it. So um, we have these calls because we sell forecasting software. We have forecast calls quite frequently. So my boss said, I'll take those. And so that takes an hour off my day. Um, so now I can work on deals two hours a day. But I'm, it's really important to time block for me that I have a certain percentage of my time on deals, a certain percentage of my time on internal, a certain percentage of time with my people. Yeah, I love time blocking. It's like, it changed my life when I first started a couple of years back. Everyone's yeah. like, oh, your calendar's so full. I'm like, no, I'm just letting you know I'm busy because just because the calendar is empty doesn't mean I'm not working. So now you can see what I'm working on. Oh yeah. Well, oh, for, for, for me, I, I've always worked with either one right now. I'm working with half a salesperson, but I used to work with one salesperson. And even if my calendar is blocked, he would double book. And it, it's just a conversation that we'd end up having. Like, anyway, uh, this is booked because I'm working on a demo for you, which made it easier being working with one salesperson because Everything I'm doing, I'm doing for that guy. I'm not doing for somebody else. So you tell me which is the priority and I'll go fix it. But I can imagine you not having that same experience because you're working with eight different salespeople. How do you manage keeping all of them happy? Um, you know, that hasn't been a challenge. I don't get too many competing priorities for some reason. Not at this role. The other... The last time at my past job I did, but um, this one, it just tends to work out. It looks really scary the week before. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have three POCs hitting at the same time. And then all of a sudden one will slip and one will move up and it just naturally works itself out. Um, but yeah, in the past life, it was, I had to go to the manager, the sales leader and say, okay, what are your top deals? I'm going to work on those. And you have to tell your AEs that that's my priority because you know, I'll say it, but they're going to respect it when it comes from you. Very cool. No, that makes sense. Um, I do want to quickly ask a question because you have the perspective of being both an SE and an SE manager, and, and you've done both for a decent amount of time now. Um, we've heard it from a few different people, kind of what are some of the decisions that people have to make if they want to jump into the role, maybe some of the, the differences, I suppose, but it'd be really cool to get your perspective as well and seeing that now that you've seen both sides, what would you maybe tell an SE potentially looking to become an SE manager. Um, and I, I guess that wouldn't really make as much sense to go the other way around because they would have already been an SE. So, uh, so yes, what would you say? Yeah. Um, so I did not ever want to be a manager just to start. Like that had no pull for me because I did not want to know anybody else's business. I didn't care and I didn't want to be a therapist and I didn't want to have the responsibility of having, you know, do something to someone's job if needed, and then they lose their income. I didn't want that on my shoulders. Um, but I got bored at work with the building and the repetitiveness. It was just, it wasn't too easy. It was just too boring. And so I was lamenting to my VP and he's like, oh, you should try being a manager. I was like, you're crazy. And I thought about it and I'm like, you know, why not? Um, so we tried it out. So that's my first recommendation. If if you think you want to be a manager, see if you can try it out for a while. Do it at the company that you are established in, that you have credibility, that you are kind of sailing in your job. And ask if you could be a team lead for like three or six months. And ask or define what that means. How is that different from just an SE? So are you going to run certain team meetings? Are you going to assign deals you know, if you don't have a one-to-one -one mapping, um, but define what extra you're going to be doing and give it a try. For me, I was supposed to do a six month trial and we decided I should just be a manager at two months because it just felt so right. Um, now, since I left, I used to be at Aptis and a lot of us have left Aptis since then. And my fellow managers, a lot of them went back to being individuals, myself included. I didn't do it because I specifically wanted to be an individual, but they did. And so I asked them that. I'm like, why don't you want to be a manager? And I don't get it because I, I crave it. And they said, 
it's the people. Like, I just need to worry about me right now. I can't worry about everyone else. So I think the biggest difference here is how much do you want to take on somebody else's performance or emotions or responsibilities, especially like now with everything going on. Um, I do play a little bit of a therapist role, like, and I don't mind it, but some people can't handle that. Um, you have to be empathetic and you have to be in a good place yourself to be willing to burden some of that stress off of them and onto you. We had a manager on the show, Liz uh, Fredis Whitaker, and she mentioned when she became a, she was also thrust into that position. And when she became manager, her priorities shifted from being about her to being about her team. And it is hard to, if you're not in a good place and you're not happy, how are you going to take care of a team that and make sure that they're happy? So it's interesting. But what I'm impressed with was you actually told your VP your board. Not many people would do that. And yeah, well, I told my CFO I was going to quit too before I had another job lined up. <laughs> um, again, no filter. That was one of the comments I've had shared with me. But I'm just a transparent person. I think all the cards on the table is better for everybody. Um, but yeah, and, and I appreciated it when my employees told me the same too, like when they would share th their thoughts and opinions. And sometimes it was something I was already working on and I couldn't tell them, but sometimes it was something I hadn't thought of. So always, I think it's honesty is the best policy. If you're not happy, say it before somebody picks up on it and you get cut. What was the book about candidness that you, you mentioned? Oh, Radical Candor. You wrote that? No, no, no. I read that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, that's, that was a life changing book for me. And, um, one of my VPs recommended it and I've since recommended it to my other co-manager and he's like, wow, I can't believe I haven't read this before. This is great. Um, so I strongly recommend it for anyone who's thinking about or is in leadership. So like, I feel like based on what you were saying, you were already candid. What did I this book do for you? Yeah. So it made me realize how and when to apply my candidness how to read the room um i always kind of wondered if maybe i'm just on the spectrum somewhere because i sometimes have a hard time picking up on subtlety um and so the the book helped me realize like you can be candid and you should be candid and but it also has to be in line with trust you have not earned the right yet to tell someone to do something different if they don't trust you. So then you're just being bossy or be or whatever else or jerk, you know, then you're just micromanaging. So you have to have the relationship and then you can have the authority. And then they have this great chart about um, when you are being candid or when you're giving feedback that you could fall into one of four camps and you want to fall in the radical candor camp, which is I'm being truthful, but I'm doing it in a loving, well-meaning way to help you versus if you're going to be ruinously empathetic, like, Oh, I really like you. No, you're not. It wasn't that bad. Don't. Well, yeah, it's just a little thing. Yeah. It's just his opinion. Like, that's ruinously empathetic because you're not telling them they need to change. And then there was where I was falling into, which was just plain rude. Um, <laughs> And I forget what the fourth one is, but it might be not speaking up at all. But the goal is to be radically candid, to have that balance of I'm doing this because I care about you and here's just enough um, truth. That's so, uh, yeah, goodness gracious. Um, yeah, I'll talk about it later, but uh, that's uh, I, I could not relate more to the, what you just mentioned there about what, walking that line is so difficult between, um, you know, call not necessarily calling out a situation but two people that, that 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 you trust and whatnot to call out a very difficult situation but in a way that you know really has you maintain that relationship that you want to maintain with them um it, it's important to be able to know how to do that without a doubt uh but i do want to ask another oh, sorry go ahead before i do well i just want to follow up on that um since i've read that i've had the honor of hiring three people um since i've become a manager so three people in two months and um when I call their references now, one of the things I ask them is I ask the reference, have you read Radical Candor? And so far everybody has. And then I say, um, what kind of feedback does this person respond best to? 
and they'll tell me they'll, they'll be like, Oh, they're really gentle. Like you, you gotta be gentle with this person. They're vulnerable to, you know, or, Hey, they need to hear it. Cause sometimes they think they're all that in a bag of chips and you need to take the wind out of their sails. So that has been really helpful as a framework for me to communicate with other managers about how to manage my team. Yeah, no, that actually reminds me of, uh, I think I could throw it back now cause it's not a company anymore, unfortunately, but, uh, Back at a company called Halogen that I used to work for, um, they're a talent management company. They um, they had a, a, a part of their product had to do with the Myers Briggs assessment. So they would have each person, uh, a part of your human resource pro- profile rather, have each person be tied to whatever their their assessment thing was, and or whatever the four letters ended up being for those four for those people. And with that came along, you know, how to best work with them, um, how to best approach them with things, their working styles, things like that. And it's so helpful to be able to go to somebody you've never spoken to before and have a sense of, um, you know, this is kind of how they want to be approached. This is how they want to be dealt with and on a human level. And it's come up a lot during the show, the importance of being human, uh, not only just speaking to prospects with your own people, especially. Um, Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic to understand, to take the initiative to understand how they like to work best is great. Um, I do want to also quickly ask a question around the transparency side. I think you've already kind of mentioned it, and I think the radical candor bit probably helped refine it even further. Um, but did you ever get pushback? So as a manager, sometimes being transparent, uh, maybe being, yeah, maybe being transparent could, could, could lead to being too transparent, potentially. Have you ever got that pushback uh, from other people kind of at your level even? And then how do you deal with that? No, not, not about being too transparent, because it's quite clear as your manager what you can and can't share or at least in a good culture it should be um it's your job to be the steady force or at least that's how i see it um you know if people are panicking you don't want to contribute to that um so you don't want to gossip and you you are told when you can't share information so if you listen to that you won't be too transparent um i think it's just more about how you deliver the feedback like especially for ramping SEs, the first time around, I would watch a demo from my team and I'd write down every little thing they did wrong and I'd hand them the list. Here's all 50 things, go fix it. You know, and that maybe wasn't the best way. So now after reading Radical Candor and a couple other books on feedback and coaching, I'm like, oh, so now I break it into big rocks and small rocks. And I say, hey, I wrote down five positive things and I wrote down the two biggest things you can change for the biggest impact. And then all these other little things down here, those are like nice if you have time to work on them, you know, um, maybe stop that. Uh, um, saying, oh, yes, I'm doing it. Stop saying um so much. It's minor, but the biggest thing is you need more customer stories. So I'm trying to funnel and give them guidance on what is the most impactful for them right now, rather than overwhelm them with all the feedback. So I'm still being transparent. It's just how I'm delivering it. The thing about sales engineering is you cannot hide as a sales engineer. Other jobs, you could be a software engineer or a product verification engineer, and the team can pick you up. But as sales engineers, we're in the spotlight quite often. That if you're not telling someone or you're not being candid with someone, they're going to get embarrassed. So I love that you the, the fact that you have to tell them something is is not negotiable. I just love that you kind of change the way you tell them. So that that's fairly interesting. And that being said, like I really, this time around as a manager, my uh, area to work on is to be more direct and not soften the blow as much. I've like swung the pendulum in the other way is the feedback yeah. I'm getting now. It's like, you're kind of too nice. Like tell them what you're really thinking and don't sugarcoat it. So I've got to, balance it back now uh, this, oh, sorry, so, go ahead. just a, are you hard on yourself do you feel like you're hard on yourself i always find area for improvement i think okay. you're never done growing so if yeah. you just have a growth mindset i don't know if that's being hard on yourself but yeah i always think i can do better well the reason i'm bringing it up is you called yourself out on saying um on the show so if, if you're calling yourself out, it's okay to call your teammates out. Like you're kind of leading by example. So yeah, I, I like that. Benny, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no. Uh, oh, my girl was going to ask. Oh yeah, right. So you, you mentioned this idea of like recognizing that perhaps you're being too nice with the people that you're working with now or your employees rather, and then uh, having to be a little more direct with them. 
uh, what were you like as an SC to your SC managers or whoever it was that you were reporting to? Did you find that you were maybe not as direct as you should have been then? Or maybe were you extremely direct? And now with the experience you've had as a manager, uh, would you say being more direct is, is okay if you're naturally not going to do that? Yeah. Um, I'm finding recently, I am finding my voice a little bit more now that I've been in the role for a couple months. Um, I'm not shy about asking for help or delegating. And I wonder if I do that too much, but um, so that helps. But sometimes I don't speak up if something feels off. So I told my boss before I got the promotion that one of the things I want to work on is trusting my gut more. So if something feels weird or if I'm asking a question in my head, but I haven't said it out loud, I need to remind myself to, to say what I'm thinking and, and really bring it up, even if nobody else is bringing it up. So sometimes that's hard for me. If it, but if I feel strongly about something, I'm not going to stay quiet. Maybe you just need a day or two to digest what you're feeling. Sometimes yeah. it's trusting your gut. You may say, say something that is incohesive or maybe rude or something like that. So sometimes a couple of days would help in formulating your thoughts. A couple of days too long in the startup world. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, whatever it is, you might just need some time to put your uh, thought and make it into words and say it out loud. Because I feel like if I trust my gut, my gut is usually right. But if I just say whatever my gut is thinking, I'm usually very, and you can ask many about that, I'm very abrasive, very in your face. I will tell you exactly the way it is. And not many people like it. Just ask my wife. Um, so <clears throat> I need a couple of days. Similar. What was that? Yeah, sounding very similar to what I, the feedback I was getting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's why I take a couple of days. And I'm not in the startup world. I have, I'm in a very big organization, which is slow and methodical. So I have that time. But for someone in the startup world, maybe a couple hours or 50, whatever it is, just not in the moment. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, exactly. And one well, of the things I'm working on right now with my team is um, being agile in their thoughts and in their delivery because we can prepare for an hour and then we get in the room and things are completely different than what we prepared for. And so that's an area that my whole team can improve on. And so to that end, what I've been doing, so I don't have to give them feedback on that because that's really hard. How do you judge or grade that? What I've been doing is um, we're trying to have more fun at work, you know, with all the stress. So we have, um, a half hour every day just to be social as a team and I lead one day a week and so the day I lead we do improv games nice. so it's a game it's not work related but I'm inserting a skill hopefully can you uh, share like it. can you yeah. share one of the games yeah sure um so we will all three of us tell a story but we each get to contribute one word so I'll give you the, the premise and then we'll start. So I'll say something like, uh, we're all going to the beach. And then Ramsey, you'd say, um, we, and then, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. No, just Vinny is good. Vinny, <laughs> yeah. you would say brought, and I'd say picnic blankets. And then Ramsey would say, That's and Sam, it, <laughs> you know, it goes like that, right? So do you want to play? Yeah, let's do it. Betty, you up for it? Let's do yeah, it. So I'll, the premise is um, we are astronauts getting ready for the launch into space. All right. So I'll go first and I'll say um, we are so nervous and also still excited, but when we see our <laughs> I shouldn't say that entrails. All right, I should maybe... <laughs> no, don't don't guess yourself. You said it. All right, Vinny. Are we continuing? Oh sweet. Yeah. Um through the mirror. I don't know that's two words, but you can say that. I'll say the mirror, Betty. <laughs> um I awoke the rest of the team 
There we go. <laughs> so our story, we're going to space, we're nervous and excited, but when we saw our entrails in the mirror, we woke the rest of the team. <laughs> because, you know, we were dreaming perhaps, and then we woke up and woke up with the team. And anyways, maybe you could say I had a, anyways, yeah. That's, <laughs> I like the game, that's a warm up game. Um, this one, this is my favorite. It's called okay. Yes And, and this is our job as sales engineers. Um, so we're all risk takers here. I just want to say that you guys show up, do this podcast every day. You're not shy. So don't be shy in this game. You need to be bold. You need to like really stretch out here. Okay. okay. So I'll say something like I went to work and then you're going to, oh, excuse me, we're going to play hype, man. I'm getting my games confused. You're going to hype it up, Ramsey. You're going to say, something really cool about how I went to work. You're going to make me sound like the most awesome person in the world. And I went to work the most awesome way. So you might say, yeah, Diana went to work on her diamond encrusted unicycle and she made it to work in five minutes, even though people in cars take 15 because she runs on pixie dust. Okay. You're going to like really okay. exaggerate. Come up with a story basically. Yeah. Right. The whole point of this game is to work with the person, you know, to build up their self-esteem, to um, yes and or boost what they're saying and to give them credibility and to make it exciting. I, I do have a question. Did you have that prepared, the whole bit about your uh, diamond-encrusted car with, driving on pixie dust? Or did you just that think of it? That was one. Um, I'd used the diamond-encrusted before when the last time we played this game, but I made up okay. the pixie dust right now. Okay. All right. Well. <laughs> So you can draw from something that's already in your head. You don't have to think of it right away, but um, it's, it's more about you and your partner working together in this game. Okay. So you're going to take something mundane and really hype it up. So okay. um, Ramsey, I have a, a hot drink here that I'm enjoying. Hype up the hot drink. I've actually seen her make that hot drink. It's made of liquid gold with some hot cocoa in it and little sparkles on the top that when you drink it, it just melts your heart and it feels like you can jump 17,000 feet in the air. That's a hell and of a that, drink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it made no sense whatsoever, but okay. <laughs> so me. All right, Ramsey, now you pick something mundane and then Vinny will hype it up. I worked on my stand-up desk today. Worked on your stand-up desk? Oh, man. Do you mean the one thing that society says, or rather that, that, that society is moving into to, to be better, uh, just workers in general, stand-up desks? Ramsey, you're, doing the, you're ahead of the curve with respect to where people are going, where offices are going, with respect to how to just be a, a better person in general. And not only that, the stand-up desk that he has, it's the best of the best. It's an ergonomic stand-up desk that actually just raises with him because it knows the importance that Ramsey holds when he walks into the office to work on this desk. And uh, yeah, goodness gracious, I don't have a stand-up desk yet, but I, every time I ever you know, get to see Ramsey, I see a glimpse of that desk and I just feel a little bit worse because of it because I know that that's the thing that's keeping me from being a better person. And yeah, I love that stand-up desk. Wow. <laughs> I, I bought my stand-up desk from Ikea, and now I feel like it's worth a lot more. <laughs> it is, man. There's it's all about helping your co-presenter feel worthy and feel excited and, like, give each other energy and just to be a positive person to work with. This, this know, was like very interesting. Yeah. Like, and you do that once a week with your team. Yep. I'm going to use that. two weeks in a row now. We started doing it during COVID, but... Back at Aptis, um, we sponsored a stand-up improv class for Salesforce SEs to attend because we were trying to partner with them. And uh, I got to go because we sponsored it. They gave us two spots. So me and my boss went and um, we learned for two days, we learned all these different improv games and stand-up games and just got to know each other in a goofy environment, but it was very applicable to work. And so I've wanted to bring it to the team. And now that we have this fun time that we do every day, it's like, okay, this is the chance. So I'm, we have a coffee break once a week with SE Nation. Like I sent an email out on my email list. If, uh, if you're able to join, I'd love for you to lead one of these sessions with random strangers who show up on the call. If you're available, I realize I will try. I yeah. told my boss I was going to cut doing <clears throat> extracurricular stuff. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> and I work on the two percent that's gonna get me 
to a hundred percent. So that's, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I, well, I just learned two, uh, two new games from you right now. So maybe we'll implement and I'll let you know how they went. There yeah. is a woman that teaches stand up for SEs and she teaches SE presentation skills. Julie Henson. I think so. It's called demo to win is the program she teaches. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's been on the podcast. Yeah, and she, but she also has a class that she'll come and do stand up or do right. improv games with you um, okay. for an SC team. Okay, nice. Well, quick question. What do you think, though, about, and maybe this is a bad question to ask, but um, do you think that you need a certain culture of an SC team or you need a certain culture within your team to have something like that be effective? Or could you say, you know, you could take a, a group of older, maybe disgruntled SCs and kind of have the same type of experience with them? Um, if it's done well, I think you can have the same type of experience because no matter your age, like anybody wants to laugh. Oh, yeah, it's a bad thing. So. <laughs> well, if, if they're disgruntled, this could change it into non-disgruntled. It could help, if, yeah. especially if they're disgruntled. But yeah, people aren't going to be as receptive to it at first. Yeah. Um, so it it doesn't work just once. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well we have a million other questions about this and other things, but I think it's, uh, we're short on time. So let's just move on to the not so fire round. Okay. And have you, you have, you listened to the show before maybe once or twice. So yeah, a while ago. So remind me what's the round. It's uh, I ask you uh, four questions that I ask every other SE who's been on the show and you take your time answering them because it's a not so fire round. Okay. <laughs> or if you want to ask them, uh, answer them in, fire around succession we can do that as well well i'm warmed up from our improv so there we go so what is the one uh benny that's your question you go ahead uh, so i get uh yeah so you know you've been now uh, both an sc as well as an sc manager so maybe pick and choose between either role maybe both whatever you'd like what do you love about being fill in the blank as one or the other mm. you... uh it's it's for both roles what i love about it is being a problem solver um, that's just me. It, my natural best is problem solving. So whether I'm solving problems for customers or solving problems for my employees or my AEs, that's what our job is. And as an SE, you get to solve a lot more problems in a shorter amount of time. Very cool. Nice. So we're doing it in fire round succession. Got it. Uh, what is the one thing you would change about your job other than uh, reducing it from 10 hour to eight hour days? No, I wouldn't change that. Um, what is one thing I would change about my, as a manager at this company? Um, I mean, it, it's nothing about the job per se that I would change. I think it's great. I think I wish I could travel more, you know, just for my work personal yeah. situation with a three-year-old yeah, okay. travel isn't in the books. Um, but I, I do wish I could get face to face with more customers outside of the Bay Area market. Right. Okay. That's a good answer. It's uh, worst way in our situation. Benny, you got That's the next a one. Market to be stuck in, though. Worst case, I suppose. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So you already mentioned a few, which is which, which are great. We have them down now. Um, what would you say are some other, or maybe those are the main books, resources, or tools that you use or would recommend to others? Um, are there any others in additional to say a time to kill or perhaps radical candor or, or anything else? Yeah. Um, Brene Brown is another book, another author to follow. Um, and Simon Sinek, those are my top three authors right now that I'm really into reading. Um, but also it's not a book, but I just want to give a shout out to a program I'm part of called Girls Club. And it's for women in sales who want to take the next level of their career. So whether go from an IC to a manager or manager to VP and it's not for SEs specifically, but we are salespeople first. So I've participated in this program and it's not cheap and I got a scholarship for it. So, um, and I feel so guilty for not remembering the name of the company that gave me the scholarship right now. Um, but it, it's an amazing program. And if anybody has a chance to go through it, I recommend they do it six months. It's not too intensive but they have a conference every year called rise up. And I went to that conference last year during my change to be more EQ oriented. 
And it was absolutely the best conference I've ever attended. And I used to work in marketing doing conferences. So I can feel confident in saying that the, just the level of truth and vulnerability and quality of the content and the people. Um, so the huge shout out to girls club and the rise up conference is an amazing resource for anyone in sales. Do you have uh, the link handy so I can we can put it on the show notes? You just, that doesn't have to be right now. Maybe after. Yeah. So it's so <clears throat> careful what you Google. Um, <laughs> I know. That's why I'm pound, asking. <laughs> put the pound sign first, and then girls plural club, <laughs> and uh, they have a um, LinkedIn group and they have a Slack group. So okay. yeah, the first link when you put the pound sign is the LinkedIn. Okay, got it. All right, and uh, uh, Aviv, we're on the last question of the day. What separates, in your opinion, great SEs or SE leaders from the okay and not so good? Ooh, there's so many things. Um, First one that comes to mind, improv style. Yes, you know, I, I'm going to go with, I mean, anybody can be great, but experience is the best teacher. So if you can learn from your experiences quickly and make the mistake only once, you're going to be a better manager, a better SE, or even better if you can learn from the mistakes of others and like really listen to the warnings that you're getting or the guidance that you're getting. Um, I had the pleasure of working with someone who was much more experienced um, than I am, even though they were my direct report. And I learned so much from them in just how they handle the deal, how they project manage the AE, how yep. they coordinate their sales cycle. They weren't serving the AE. They were really co-selling. And I hadn't seen that because in my past role, I was managing people who are emerging talent fresh out of college. So to right. get to work with someone that closely, it, it's a game changer when you can take control and take ownership of your world and be the CEO of your deals, that's when you're going to be most successful. And I think that's something you learn through experience. That is perfect. If people want to connect with you, where can they do that? LinkedIn. I'm in there every day. That's what okay. I say for fun. Um, yeah. So Diana Lestinotter Capello. And uh, I'm pretty responsive. If you put in the chat why you're adding me, that would be great. If you don't, I'm going to ask you. So be ready with an answer. Okay. I'll be sure to, we're not connected for some strange reason. I'll be sure to that add a note. Well, okay. we're connected on the forums. So that's where we're, our conversation is. Anyways, thanks a lot for your time. I do appreciate it. Uh, stay sane and safe during these uh, strange times. Thank you for coming on. Thanks. Thanks, Diana, for your time. This was, I, I really enjoyed it. And, uh, it's interesting to see someone understand what they did and then make it better. Agreed. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, also just big fan of storytelling myself. I remember seeing a Ted talk not so long ago, actually a very long time ago about the importance of storytelling. Um, and that was within a business context. And this too just kind of reinforced that idea that yeah, telling stories is really what we're trying to do while, while, while presenting things and being an SE. I feel like there are two different kinds of stories. There are stories that happen with a customer, like this customer did this because of that, so that's a story. But there's also a story about like potential outcomes if we don't do something. So you can say they're kind of related, though, right? Like I, mean, I think you're right. Like those are kind of different types of or maybe the content and those stories would be a little bit different. But it's always about kind of getting them to, as as Diana mentioned, imagine like imagine yourself in this situation and imagine what could happen. Imagine what what can be. Um, and uh, so long as you could articulate that well in a nice cohesive way, you should find some success. Imagine well, the, that. Yeah, the reason I'm bringing it up is most people don't think that just a story for the sake of story is good. Sure, no, it has to fit. Right? For sure. Absolutely. Well, no, like you can, like everybody says that it has to be a customer story. What I'm saying, it doesn't have to be a customer story. It could be okay. just a story of what potentially could be like, oh, true, true, if, true. if yeah. we had talked about to people about COVID, like, hey, imagine COVID would hit, like, it's an unnamed entity. Like, imagine there's a like pandemic. What would you do then, right? 
Like it, right. it could Probably be something uh, future. What was right. that? No, I was going to make a bad joke. I was going to say, jump on a phone and, and, and lip sync to imagine or sing to imagine. <laughs> that whole thing and all those. Yeah, people. yeah. I, I saw, I saw about, oh, we're, I saw about the celebrity thingy singing Imagine. Yeah. I just never clicked on it because I don't want to yeah, hear him sing really Imagine. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll listen to John Lennon singing Imagine. It's probably better. For sure. But yeah. And like, I'll, like we talked about storytelling. That was one major topic, but leadership was another major topic. And yeah. her struggles and her identification of what she went through to become a better leader, that impressed me. Mm-hmm. And the fact that she pretty much has no filter. Yeah, but then also learning how to control that filter or control it so that she could apply a filter when necessary. Um, and uh, definitely a big, big thing too. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, in the meantime though, um, I mean, stay, jump on the forums if you're looking for a little bit of human interaction to do with SEing. Uh, jump on the email list to take part in the coffee sessions that are happening, uh, which could even be tailored to your, t- to your time zone. So that's pretty sweet. Um, if Taylor, tailored ish uh, from like so this is going to be coming out in a couple of weeks last week I did two and it was too, a little, little bit too much for me uh, time wise I can't yeah. commit that much time so I'm going to do once a week one in the morning eastern time which should support people in Europe and uh, Asia and one in the afternoon here which should support people in the west coast so like it's just fun last time we had like 10 people from one company so it was uh it was interesting just talking to them but and free yeah yeah it's free it's just like it's just like to support the se nation basically yeah check it out pretty good pretty handy resource i'll uh, have to throw myself in there eventually yeah Uh, well we've had peter cohen join twice brian jerry joined three times chris white joined once so we had one guy who's been on an SE on the job for eight months. He had the chance to ask Brian and Peter whatever you wanted for like five minutes. That's awesome. That's wonderful. So yeah, it might be you next time. Uh, the reason I rewarded him with that is because he joined in and he didn't know anybody. Yeah. A friend of a friend told him about the <laughs> coffee wow. break and he just joined. I'm like, yes, you get That's to ask awesome. questions. Yeah. Very cool. Anyways, not to belabor the point, this is Ramsey for Benny. We're signing off.